as the spirit moves is something I learned many years ago from a mentor, the Reverend Glenda Gray, who would intentionally weave into her preaching schedule an unplanned, unpremeditated sermon that wasn't tied to a title uh, and a blurb that the newsletter editor wanted a month ahead of time and wasn't dictated by a theme or a litur liturgical calendar. For Reverend Glenda, as the spirit moves, was apropos of whatever bubbled up for her. In my memory, Glenda's so-called ATSM sermons were some of her best. While not making any predictions about my own hand at this, I do believe that preaching need, uh, preachers need to be open on occasion to what might bubble up. If, for example, I quiet myself and listen for the still small voice within. Now, for me, that's a challenge because it requires me to sit still, listen. And as you know, my schedule is full and it's hard to carve out that time. But even though I'm not always entirely happy with my dog Daisy waking me up at six o'clock in the morning to go um, and to be walked as I live in a nearby apartment. I found it a gift where in the early morning walking, Daisy and I have the whole neighborhood to ourselves, save for the bird song, the noisy squawking of the Egyptian geese or the spotting of an occasional snowy white egret. And recently, I spotted what was surely an otter swimming in the canal. Is that possible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Wasn't seeing things. So as I walk with Daisy on quiet mornings and I witness to the fauna that live, I think, in some ways, improbably alongside us humans in this bustling Boca community. The idea of witness comes into focus, and it occurred to me that as your minister, I have many tasks, but I'm also witness to the life of the congregation. And in some ways, I'm witness to your lives. Now, the degree to what I, as your minister, witness of your lives varies greatly among you. I mean, don't worry. I don't know anything that you haven't told me or disclosed. <laughs> um, but indeed, and, and indeed, many of you share with each other much more of your lives than you do with me. But I do hear your so, uh, sorrows and joys on Sunday morning, and indeed some of you come into my office and tell me more. And that is as it should be. That's what ministers do, listen and provide pastoral support to members and friends of the congregation. But another aspect of my witness to you all that seems to want voice is the weightiness of it. In other words, on the whole, it feels like at this time we're running a bit heavy on the side of fear and worry, myself included. We, of course, in our individual lives are <clears throat> have different experiences, everything from the joy of a new great grandbaby to incurring personal loss in one form or another. 
But at the same time, together, we are living under the pall of some very tough times globally that test our faith and cause us pain, psychically and spiritually. And as a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we are also facing institutional change, all while trying to decide how to best use the finite resources we have to complete the transitional work remaining and bridge this fellowship to a new iteration, a new era of UUFBR. And of course, that's going to usher in yet another change. So as witness, I'm here to testify that all of what I just listed is a lot to bear individually and together as a congregation. While sometimes I long for a wand and a bibbity bobbity do and just, you know, wipe it all out, make everybody happy, myself included, make things all better. We are much better off leaning into these challenging times and learning how to bear the weight which comes upon us, unbidden in a world in which we have some agency, but really when you think about it, we have very little control over world affairs and powers that far exceed our own. Yet, in recognizing our limitations, how do we keep from succumbing to further depths of worry and fear? Because we're not always our best selves when, our, when we're fearful. And how do we maintain our Unitarian Universalist trait of optimism while recognizing that none of us are spared tragedy in our lives, and that something we are always something we're not entirely anxious to talk about is evil, human constructs of evil, and how do we keep from burying our heads in the sands when when we live with the abuse of power, when we live with folks who become isolated and their hearts hard, and sometimes they wreak havoc, havoc in that state. So to address the questions, in terms of a kind of a serendipity around, um, around this as the spirit moves. I found a book um, on the shelf in the study that is not mine, but it's there nonetheless, and it's by George Kimmich Beach. That's his name ring a bell with anybody? He's been around for a long time. He's a Unitarian Universalist minister who in this book tackles several existential issues, he says, of faith. His book is titled, If Yes is the Answer, What is the Question? And he refers to Jacob Trapp, who is a Universalist from, um, from the uh, 19th century, who says we need to say yes to a lot of things but he doesn't say what the question is. So in his book, Beach explores how we as Unitarian Universalists might acknowledge tragedy in our lives, acknowledge that sometimes evil does cause tragedy in our lives, and how do we not lose our hearts? And by that he means how do we keep our hearts soft? How do we keep our hearts open in the face of this? 
So first of all, Beach is a dev devotee of James Luther Adams. And Adams is a mid 20th century theologian who helped define what we know to be Unitarian Universalism today. And Adams said that with resources, both human and in divine, we ought to be able to cre create meaning in our lives. And that ought to lead us to a, an outlook on life that is optimistic. But Beach says also that we should understand and fully acknowledge our human limitations and frailties. We need to understand our human condition and that we are not invulnerable to tragedy and suffering. So we really do well together as, as long as we're not too challenged, right? But sometimes our faith is lacking in what to do when times are really tough and they don't make sense. And our reason doesn't, isn't sufficient for, um, to process what's going on around us. And we Unitarian Universalists tend to be a bit stoic, but we're not invulnerable to tragedy and suffering. And so if we lean in to being vulnerable, to letting ourselves suffer, we're in a better position for full recovery. And Beach says this leads us to emotional and spiritual growth and maturity. I have an example. In 1995, when Timothy McVeigh bombed a federal building in Oklahoma City, he did so knowing there was a daycare center on the ground floor. And a couple lost their young daughter in that incident. Yet after the memorial was built to the 168 people who lost their lives, they would visit on their daughter's birthday and tie balloons to the fence near her marker and celebrate. And when they were asked, asked by a um, newspaper uh, reporter why they do this, why they chose to do that, they replied, we are grateful that she was in our life even for a short time. She was our daughter with likes and dislikes of personality and love to give. We want to remember her and celebrate her in a way that eclipses the evil act that took her from us. Now, it may have taken this couple a while to get there, but this couple symbolically chooses life over death. And Beach cites Deuteronomy 3019 to underscore this concept. I, being the God of Israel, set before thee this day good and evil, life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. To ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? assumes that being good assures justice. But we know realistically that that's simply not true. A man stricken with cancer on his deathbed asks his priest, why me? And the priest asks a question in return, why not you? The priest is not being cruel. He's saying that if it was not the man before him who had cancer, it would be another. In some ways, our human condition is tragic and therefore it is our benefit to our benefit and spiritual well-being to willingly play the hand that life has dealt us. 
And of course, that is not an easy thing to do with grace and a plum. To ask, are people basically good or are they evil? begs the question of agency and free will. A better question would be, what is our capacity to love? Mature love is concerned for the well-being of another. To love on the condition of being loved in return is what W.H. Auden called to be loved alone. And putting people in broad categories of good versus bad is a trap because as humans, we are at once complex and nuanced. And Beach says that when we believe people are inherently good, we make the mistake of assuming that with enough freedom to act, we can change the world. How often have I said that from this pulpit? But he gives me pause, he gives me cause to pause and think. And it's not as though we cannot, we should not undertake or do what we can do to be concerned for the other and to change what we can. But to think that we can change the world, we are going to fall short. We're setting ourselves up to, for failure. We understate, we underestimate our agency, our power, and our frailties in being um, perhaps over optimistic about human nature. On the other hand, when we think of people as inherently bad, we assume that people will always mishandle freedom and agency. Inevitably, they'll mess up. But we know that that's not always true as well. Beach uh, quoted a social commentator as observing that people today who take a dim view of humanity are erstwhile optimists who got mugged. And that's actually what my husband says about me. Um, as a career in law enforcement, he has seen the uh, frailty, the human frailties, and how they get in trouble. Um, and says that, um, that my view is too optimistic. You can't. Um, you cannot be in the world uh, with the, from the position of being all unicorns and rainbows. So on the extremes, both positions miss the mark. Good and evil don't lie within the individual, but in our human condition. We all share. We all have the capacity for both. But it is too big of a word, it's too big of a label to put on one another in our individual lives. So let me attempt to bring this home for us. In a world that feels chaotic, in a place of shifting sands where it's hard to make sense of things and we don't always feel safe, let this fellowship, this religious community that we share be a respite, or better yet, a place where we support one another in our own attempts to find solid footing again. And in this, I would ask that we avoid making assumptions. Let us be curious with one another. Let us put kindness first. 
And during these tough times, I ask that we try to engage five ways of being that George Kimmich Beach presents. He says, taking these up and, and be leaning into these ways of being have been um, scientifically, if you will, proven to create new neural pathways for us in our brains. So they are. Be attentive. Be reasonable or use your intellect, your knowledge. Be accountable. Be responsible. But most of all, be in love, all right? Be in love. Am I talking about romantic love? No. I'm talking about being in a place of love that equates to concern for our fellow human beings. Be in love with your life, in love with others in this fellowship. Being in a state of love is the only way not to lose our hearts, not to grow bitter and isolated in the face of tragedy, in the face of evil, and in the face of change that we didn't ask for. And no please that I hold you in witness and in faith and in love. And I would like to leave you with this poem by Don, uh, John O'Donohue. It is a blessing that he wrote for his mother. On the day when the, weight, when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. When the canvas frays and the kurach of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, come to awaken you, a meadow of delight. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. May it be so.